I'd like you to open your Bible to 1 Corinthians 14. I sense I have one major assignment this morning, but I also sense an assignment for this season. And I'm going to try to have wisdom not to unpack the season in this service. It is a vital and crucial time to be an ambassador of Christ. There is going to be a major separation and dividing between People who know the Lord, walk with the Lord, prioritize their relationship with the Lord, uh, understand the, the, the covenant of promise, understand the word of God. People who are committed to, to the word of God, right doctrine, right teaching. People who are committed to walk in the spirit of the Lord. People who are committed to build the kingdom through good works in society and bring bring. Real practical change being the hands and feet of Jesus. We need all of it. We need all of it. We need to um, pray rightly. We need to uh, praise rightly. We need to serve rightly. We need to study rightly. Rightly studying the word of God. There is going to be in these times a major uh, distinction and a separating between those who really know the Lord and those who just playing at it. Just going to church is not going to be enough. And churches will have to make a decision. Are we going to cater to a thing of entertainment and doing a little religious stuff and a little whatever stuff and, and, uh, you know, but not, not really gathering together with that unity in the spirit and that heart of faith versus the people who would who would just come and say, okay, I've done this church thing, I've done this. And, and see, when, when, you, when you have this lazy spiritual mentality, and Paul, like in, in a whole other scripture, says, I wanted to speak to you as spiritual people, but I can't. I wanted to unpack to you some real deeper spiritual things that, that Christ has already given you. I want to unpack what Christ has given you so you can walk in it and live in it. It can be a part of your life. It can show up. Not just in your spirit, uh, but show up in your life. He's saying, I want to speak to you as spiritual, but I can't because you're acting like mere men. See, once you come into a relationship with Christ, you're no longer a mere mortal. You're a new creation in Christ. Your identity has changed immediately. Your authority has changed immediately. Now, how you steward that authority and that identity is a whole other issue. That changes over time. And that's why we need to have the mindset to say, I belong to the Lord and I am going to walk as a disciple of Christ in, in my life, in my family's life. And I'm going to tell you, for, for most of us, let's stop trying to go change the world first and let it be an in me first mentality. In the world next. In me first. We've talked about that before here. So with that in mind, I want to just share a couple things with you that I think is so vital and so important. And I've, I've got a ton of scriptures on my heart and mind, a ton of things. Um, but 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual. Now the word gifts there, most of your translations will have the word gifts italicized. And it means it's not in the original language. The gifts is added based on context. And I think it's right to add the word gifts there based on context. So the verse actually reads, uh, pursue love and desire spiritual, desire uh, spirituality, desire the spiritual life, the spiritual realm. It's really talking about the full function of the spirit of God in your life, the person of the spirit, the power of the spirit functioning in your life, not as a theory, but as a practice. So some of you have had addiction function in your life as a theory. Some of you have had it as a practice. 
Some of you have had depression as a theory. Some of you have had it as a practice. Some of you have, uh, especially now, a lot of teenagers, they're taking on different things that they're hearing about in social media, in the culture, and they're taking on these different things as labels. But the label, they're, they're taking a badge or a label of a certain thing, and usually it's of a very dark or dysfunctional thing, a deceptive thing. But they take on a label, but they haven't lived the lifestyle of it. And so, so to flip that to something in, in the spirit realm, pursue love, desire, desire spiritual, the spiritual life, the full functionality, not just the label, not just the, the, the uh, definition or the dictionary definition. This is a laboratory. This thing should be living and breathing in my life. So we should pursue love, not the love of men, but the love of God. It's not talking about just pursue love, can't we all get along? It's pursuing the love of God. And it's pursuing the spiritual life of God, which, which is specifically in, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13, and 14, is talking about the spirit, the operation of what we call the spiritual gifts. The charisma of the Lord is the Greek word. And it's grace in action. It's grace gifts that are activated in our life functioning in our life, showing up in every realm in our life, not just on a Sunday morning, but we live this way. And so this verse is saying, uh, Paul has talked in, in 1 Corinthians 12, saying, do not be ignorant of, of spiritual. It's the same phrasing there, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. He says, do not be ignorant of spiritual gifts, but that word gifts there is also italicized because it's not in the original language. Now, through the rest of 1 Corinthians 12, the word gifts is in there. The word charisma is in there, and that's why the writer put it there in, in in verse 1 because it, in context it's in the rest of the chapter. So it's talking about it's talking about pursuing the spiritual life, pursuing the love of God and then earnestly desiring the spiritual gifts of God, the empowerment of God, the 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 the, the miraculous power of God brought through our lives. And I'm telling you um, if I had to title this something, it would, be, it would be called this. It would be called a supernatural people. We need to be a supernatural people. The Bible here is not telling us that it's, it's love or gifts. He's not saying we either are a people that, that love well, we walk in the love of God, or we're an empowered people who walk in the spiritual realm, releasing the gifts of God, the miraculous power of God. It's not, it's not this or this. It's this and this. Matter of fact, you can't love well without being gifted. So churches who say, I don't want to talk about the gifts. I don't want to talk about the power of God. That's, I'm scared. I've, I've heard that's weird stuff. And listen, we've all seen weird stuff in church. We've all seen people do weird stuff. You do weird stuff. I've done weird stuff. Everybody's done weird stuff. It's just you're more comfortable with your weird, but it's still weird. And so we got to grow outside of our comfort zone because I'm telling you what this, the age in which we live, the assignment in which we have as people of God, we're not merely Americans like Jamie was talking about. We're not merely citizens of this realm. We are ambassadors of, of not just, we're not just citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are ambassadors of Christ, meaning we carry the anointing of Christ with us. That his ministry is flowing through us. And so what I want us to get is pursue love. We should pursue love. Because sometimes we try to walk in an assignment. We try to walk in a gift, but we, we do it without love. We should always pursue love. We should always, and that word pursue is a really cool word. That word pursue means to hunt. Like some of y'all are hunters in, in here and you know how to hunt. And, and some of y'all hunt differently. Some of y'all hunt just sitting and some of y'all hunt like prowling, doing stuff. Some of you wait for them to come to you and some of you go to them. And, and this, this word pursue is this activating word. It's an action-driven word. It's not passive, it's active. And so we have the love of God because we're in covenant relationship with Jesus. So you're not pursuing something you don't have. You're pursuing the full function of what you do have. You're not asking God to give you love. He's already given it to you in Christ. 
So the pursuit is how do I bring that into every realm of my life, into my family, into into parenting, into, into marriage, into business. How do I walk in the love of God? Not how do I let the world define love because all love is not love. And the world has a cry for love, but it, it falls short of the love of God. And so it tries to offer in its own version of love, which in one level is just a fleshly love based on on whatever they want to base it on, uh, or at worst, it's a demonic-inspired love done through the agenda of men. But the reality is that we are called to release the love of God. And now our world is in a, a condition where we're so divided and so separated by so many different things that there's so much tension and pressure and and contention with, with different things that what ends up happening is we, we end up being so divided and everyone's like just about that, just their fuse is really short. And somebody says a little something and boom, they blow up. And it's like, what are you, what, what? What's happening? And, and, and what we need is just that, that revelation and responsibility to walk in the love of God. We need to pursue love. And I'm just telling you as a church family, that needs to be our our God-given assignment. We need to pursue love, not the way the world defines it. The world world says, if you're going to love me, you have to accept uh, everything in my life. And I don't have to accept everything in your life. Love, the love of God will confront you. That's why the Bible says, speak the truth in love. It's not enough for you to speak the truth. Some of you have been speaking the truth and turning people away from God because you're sharing a part, you're sharing a truth without the relational love. And so we need to learn how to pursue love. What does the love of God look like in this conversation? What does the love, look, love of God look like when I'm hiring somebody, when I'm firing somebody? What does the love of God look like in my household? What does the love of God look like in my finances? What does the, God, the love of God look like on my calendar? What does the love of God look like with, with me walking and receiving and living and breathing in this love of God that I first am partaking of my first love and that, that I am sustained by the love of God. I'm, I'm insulated by the love of God. I'm fueled by the love of God. So I'm not so susceptible to rejection of men because I'm accepted by God. And I know who he is and I know who I am and I have a heart motivated by love to obey him and follow him and put off the old and put on the new and put off the darkness and walk in the light. And when I think about love and pursuing love, I think about Galatians 5. Uh, Verse 22 and 23, you know it very well. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That whole chapter talks about uh, contrasting between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. And it gets to the point talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So now we're bringing in the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. We need to walk in both. When when the Bible says pursue love, I believe specifically and directly it means pursue and, and, and be committed to hunt down and chase after being committed to being a fruitful Christian. So the fruit of the Spirit is grown. The gifts of the Spirit are given. Now they have to be developed and and walk with wisdom and and learn how to be a good steward of all that. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is connected to the person of the Holy Spirit. His character, his DNA, his likeness, the likeness of Christ. And in that verse in Galatians 5.22, it it talks about the flesh and the operation of the flesh, which is is pretty obvious uh, when the flesh is operating. And then it it shifts and it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. And most Bibles have a comma there. Love, comma, uh, gentleness, peace, and and it walks through a couple different things. Uh, And it has nine things that are are listed there. But there's there's many scholars in Greek that say that we have misunderstood the context of of that because of uh, having a comma instead of a colon. See, in Greek, there is no punctuation. The punctuation was added by the translators. And so that verse, contextually, most there's many scholars that believe this, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, colon, or a colon, because then when it says, 
peace and gentleness and everything else, those are expressions of love. So simply put, pursue love. What is that talking about? I need to be fruitful. I need the fruit of the Holy Spirit. How do I get the fruit of the Holy Spirit showing up in my life? Walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. The world does not need to see more of your flesh. Physically and like (laughs) spiritually. We, we don't need to see that. There's so much corruption. There's so much chaos. There's so much division. There's so much crazy stuff going on. And so what we need to be is a people that is committed, that we are pursuing the fruit of the Spirit. We are pursuing love. That what does the love of God look like? It looks like gentleness. It looks like peace. It looks like self-control. That's what love looks like. And a matter of fact, before you go get on Facebook and start saying a bunch of stuff to some people, you need to have a screensaver or a little note card up there. Does this look like love? Does, is this the love of God? And if it's not the love of God, shut your mouth. Your need and desire to do something, to try to fix something and try to, what somebody said this morning about trying to control something or do something is messing things up. You're not contributing to the kingdom culture. What you're doing is you're confusing those who are looking for Christ, even though they're saying they don't want Christ. I think they want Christ. They don't want, but I think because of poor representation of Christ, they don't want that Christ. They don't want the American Jesus. They don't want the denominational Jesus. They want Jesus, the true lover of their soul. They just, he's not, he's just not been represented. Now I get it. There's people who you, Jesus himself was there and they still rejected him and didn't want him. People have to make their own decision, but we're responsible to walk this thing out. So a heartbeat is this, that we would pursue love, that the fruit of the spirit is love. That love shows up in gentleness. That the love of God empowers self-control. That the love of God empowers the peace of God. That, that by loving one another with the same love that he has loved us, us with, that's the new commandment, the world will know. It went from love your neighbor as yourself in the old covenant to the new covenant. The new commandment is, no, we're going to go further than that. The new commandment is not love your neighbor as you love yourself. The new commandment is you love one another as I have loved you. The problem is most of us don't walk around with a, with a true awareness of God's love over our life. We're living in performance Christianity. And if we do good, then we are good. But if we do bad, like God's love is like, I love you. It's like that, you know, the person who takes the, the, the flower, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Instead of believing the truth of the scriptures, of the finished work of Christ, he loves me. And not only does he love me, uh, and I'm, I'm born again, but you know what? He loves, he loves the person who pulled that trigger yesterday. So the, the danger of not pursuing love, listen to me, the danger of us being of us being religious minded of us of us not having a king a king driven a kingdom driven culture is we'll walk in a a man made version of love not a god um, uh, originated version of love and we'll love the people who are like us we'll love the people who agree with us politically we'll love the people who agree with us doctrinally but we won't love the people that Jesus loves. So we need to learn how to speak the truth in love. We need to learn how to walk in love, knowing that I am insulated and grounded in the love of God. That's pursuing love in every area of my life. So I I challenge you, I challenge you to go through Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and look at those lists, those eight expressions of love and challenge yourself to see how am I doing in that? Self-control, what would I grade myself on? And I'm not talking about you try harder to walk in self-control. I want you to get a revelation of God, you love me. And because you love for me, your love empowers me to walk in self-control. It empowers me. Just like lust 
empowers you towards addiction. Love empowers you to your assignment. And so the heartbeat is this. And I wish I could just tattoo it right on your forehead or right on your heart. Pursue love. Pursue love. Let this be, let's just be in our heart. I know we're called to awaken and equip to walk in God's given, our God-given purpose. How do we do that? We're pursuing love. But at the same time, we are earnestly desiring. That word means to covet. It means to lust after. It means to, it means to pursue with like intentionality to pursue this thing about the love of God uh, and, and to, walk, to, to walk not just in the love of God, but to also walk in the power of God, the miraculous power of God. This is not the generation and age that a powerless church will be okay. We need a powerful church. See, the early church was a powerful church. They walked in supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. And we have become, especially in the Western culture, more doctrine-oriented, more intellect-oriented. We think we know something if we know it here. But if you really know it, it shows up in your life. And we let experiences shape our doctrine. So if, and people accuse people like, like me and maybe people like you, they accuse us of not being biblically sound in doctrine because we believe in divine healing. Or we believe in, in uh, you know, uh, a number of, of different things. Let's just focus for time's sake on divine healing. So we believe that, that the scriptures, based on what we were singing and reading uh, through that song of Isaiah 53, uh, by his stripes we are healed. He, in the atonement that Jesus did on the cross and what he accomplished, that he carried our sorrows, our sicknesses, and our diseases. And there's prophetic... Uh, um, Examples of that all through the New Testament. By his stripes, you were healed. But most people religiously are conditioned to believe God will heal some but not heal others. Sometimes it's God's will to heal. And they'll take even what Jamie was saying earlier and they'll take it in a way that he was not meaning it, but they'll take that phrasing and take it too far and they'll say stuff like, well, you know, sometimes God will get you sick because you just have to trust what he's doing. He, he's bringing you, he's, he, and it's God's will to, to make you sick. And he's, he's, he's allowing this to happen in your life and bringing sickness or disease in your life. That's the, that would be equivalent, biblically, that would be equivalent to saying that Jesus gave me sin. That's the equivalence. And there's not a person on the planet who would say, Jesus gives me sin to teach me something. But what we do because of our experiences, what do I mean by that? We've prayed for somebody and they weren't healed. We, we diligently prayed for somebody, passionately prayed for somebody and they were not healed. Somebody else we barely prayed for accidentally and they got healed. The person we loved uh, didn't get healed. They died. The person we didn't care that much about got healed. And we struggle with it. We, we struggle with some of these different things. So if you're not careful, you'll let your experiences shape your doctrine instead of letting the scriptures shape your experiences. And so when I look at my Bible, it's not going to change. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Acts 10, 38. With the Holy Spirit, that's person and power. And he went about, meaning in his earthly ministry, doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the Father. Like Jesus goes behind like, my dad's grumpy today. (laughs) But I'm going to step in. No. But I'm telling you, there's churches and people that believe that kind of stuff. Because they just look at their experiences and they look, well, this person wasn't healed. So, and there's not, a, there's not a person in this room that if we preached the gospel and gave a salvation call and somebody wasn't saved, we wouldn't think he's not a savior. There's different reasons why people aren't healed. I don't know all of them. And I've been in very painful situations where it's really confusing on one level. But what I do, because I try to be biblical and I try to have right doctrine as I go back to the word of God and say, what does his promises declare? What does his word say? I'll tell you what his word says. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, all my soul and all that is within me. Forget not his benefits. He forgives all of my iniquities. Thank you, Jesus. 
and he heals all of my diseases. So we have to stop. We have to grow up. And when I say grow up, we need to start pursuing love. That everything God does is motivated by love. Everything he has accomplished is motivated by love. Therefore, if we're going to walk in his call and be his ambassadors, everything we do should be motivated by love. Stop letting the frustration and now there's a righteous anger. Jesus flipped over the tables in the temple. That's motivated by love. There is a righteous anger, not an unrighteous anger. We don't have the right. It says be angry and do not sin. So you can you can be angry motivated by love with a righteous anger. But you just got to walk in that. I'm telling you, I'm believing for a generation. I love what I see happening with the young people. I love it. And I just I just think God is expounding and expanding and is doing uh, amazing things. Uh, Pastors Garrett and Leslie are just doing a, a great job. And, and I just I just I just see this thing unfolding about the love of God. The love of God just beginning to just beginning to to expand. And my call to you and to us, but my call to you, teenagers, I love that you sit on the front row. All these other scared people won't do it, but you will. And here's the reality, that you pursue love. And you stop letting the world and the educators and the different people who do not know the love of God try to tell you what the love of God is, trying to tell you how to love. No, you show them the love of God. And the love of God is not some some just rule-keeping religious thing where you judge everybody. The love of God is you do speak the truth, but you speak it in love. Meaning I accept you, but I don't accept everything you do. I don't accept everything you think. I can, agree, I can disagree with you and love you at the same time. Pursue love, desire gifts. Desire the spiritual realm of the gifts of God operating in our life. That we're, it's, not, it's not love or power, it's love and power. And what we need to do with like a right foot, left foot, continuing to progress forward in this call is begin to pursue both. That the fruit of the Spirit is love. And God's character and His, His lifestyle of love is going to be in my life. I'm going to be a person marked by love. I'm going to love those who disagree with me. And how does that work? How does that work? I'm telling you, um, this is a, 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 difficult, a difficult thing for me. It might be easy for you. But different people who disagree with me or I disagree with them and they share their opinion or they share whatever, I have a knee-jerk reaction to immediately come and say, I disagree with you and show them why. Instead of just they're sharing their opinion, say, okay. Praying for you. Love you. But now if the relationship and the conversation is open to a realm of let's have a discussion about it, okay. But when somebody is just, for whatever reason, sharing something, I don't immediately have to stand up and show what I disagree with. That breeds division. But we walk in a relationship with somebody that when we have the, the right, like don't be trying to parent other people's kids. When we have the right relationship, we can speak into and ask right questions led by the Holy Spirit. Why do you believe that? What's underneath that? Have some some spirit-led dialogue that begins to open up instead of just telling people, you know, what to think. We can teach them how to think and walk in some different conversations. So the heartbeat I have for you, and, and team, you go ahead and come on up. The heartbeat I have for you is... is to really just grab hold of this pursuing love. I'm talking about in your personal life, in your, in your meaningful time with God. And if you're not having meaningful time with God, you're already behind. In your private time with God, that you begin to, I'm pursuing the love that God, Jesus has already given me. So what does love look like? Go to Galatians 5, uh, 22, and look at those, ex, those eight expressions of love. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. Look at love is patient, love is kind, and look at that and see what part of that is the weakest area in my life. And begin to just lean in and pursue growth in that area. Pursue growth in both of those areas. As you come into the house of God and meet other people, pursue what love looks like. What does God's love look like amongst us? What does God love, what does his love look like in your life groups? 
What does the love of God look like? What does the gifts of God look like publicly, corporately, here? What do the gifts of God operating look like? What does the supernatural power of God look like uh, corporately in our service? What does it look like privately in your own life? What does it look like when you show up at work? What do the gifts of the Spirit look like operating in your life group? Life groups here are a tremendous place for, I can tell you stories of different people. There's one life group we're in, we're praying for people to actually be filled with the Holy Spirit. And one lady, uh, we're sitting there, uh, went to one person, prayed over them. And, and man, they just, they lit up and immediately just started praying in tongues and praying in the Spirit right there. They, didn't, they can't even spell tongues. And they started just praying in the supernatural prayer and praise language. And you could just sense the, the power on this person's life. And, and so then I took this person and went to the next person because uh, they all said they wanted to receive this. And we went to the next person. And, and, and by the, I think it was the third person down, I just kept making this chain of like, listen, now that you have received, you can give, you can share. And so now we're praying. And this one lady was sitting here and all of a sudden she starts projectile vomiting. It's all fun at games in a life group until somebody starts projectile vomiting. And everyone goes immediately, oh, she's sick. But I knew because I've seen this many times before. No, she ain't sick. That's a demon coming out of her. So your first step is back up. It's like a Pentecostal slide. Back up. <laughs> Especially if you got good shoes. Back, woo. back up and then slide in to help out. And so she started throwing up. She ran into the bathroom, came out, and I led a, a few prayers. And I'm telling you, demons were coming out of her. Deliverance was happening. We need to be a powerful church that can set the captives free, not judge them for being captive. And so every realm of our life, we should pursue love, hate the demon, have confrontation and combat against the demon. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against these spiritual powers. Have compassion for the person, as ignorant as they are. But have confrontation against these spirits that are, that are keeping these people blind and held hostage to some of the same deception you used to be bound up in. And in every realm of our life, Pursue love. I've seen people in life groups, they start sharing and they start confessing a sin in the safety and privacy of a life group to where they know they're not going to be talked about, they're not going to be judged, and they start saying, listen, this is a struggle, this is whatever, and people just come around them and shame is broken off of them. That mercy triumphs judgment. That love wins. And now that this person knows and they're reminded of how much God loves them and there's the, the godly love that's being manifested through people, now that empowers them to walk in a lifestyle of obedience. The love of God never empowers you to disobey him. It always empowers obedience. And so the two things I want us to lean into and commit to and there's a number of stuff over the next uh, number of weeks. We're going we're to dive into gifts. We're going to dive into a number of different things. But it's going to be under these two categories for, for to be a supernatural people. We're pursuing love. We're pursuing the love of God. And we will not be distracted. Our nation may go in a billion different directions. But we are the people of God. We are kingdom Americans. And we will pursue Love, and we will earnestly desire spiritual gifts. We will earnestly desire signs, wonders, and miracles that God will show up and God will show out. And we will not be discouraged when we don't see things happening because we know it's already done. It's already finished. And I'm not looking for an experience to have an experience. I'm looking at a covenant. I'm looking at a finished promise. I'm looking at a finished work. I'm looking at the Alpha and the Omega. I'm looking at the one who has already done it, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. And he's already sealed in, the, in, in his blood. It's already done. It's already finished. We know what his will is. We don't have to wonder when sin comes into our life, God, what is your will? We don't have to wonder when sickness comes into our life, God, what is your will? We don't have to wonder when poverty shows up in our life, God, what is your will? We don't have to wonder when persecution, which that is the real suffering that we face in Christ, uh, that we, we are, they persecuted him, they persecute us. We don't have to wonder what is God's will, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. 
He's the one that takes me and makes me lie down in those green pastures. He's the one that leads me beside those still waters. He restores my soul. Then he leads me in this path of righteousness for his name's sake. And though I might walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because his rod and his staff, they comfort me. They protect me. And what does he do? He prepares a table. A table, even in the presence of my enemies. Stop focusing on the enemy. Start focusing on the table. And when you focus on what the Lord has already provided, you feed on the healing. You feed on the righteousness. You feed on the prosperity that produces generosity. You feed on the power of God. You feed on these things and you're not shaken. You don't walk by sight. You walk by faith. And now you're, a, you're an ambassador who's changing generations because you're pursuing love. And you are desiring, desiring a supernatural lifestyle. You're desiring a supernatural lifestyle. At least, at least, and I'll, I'll get out of your way after this, at least to the same degree that you desired the sinful lifestyle. At least. Whatever level of greed you walked in, that's the level of generosity you walk in. At least, as a starting point. Whatever level of lust that you walked in, purity is what I walk in. Whatever level of addiction I walked in, I walk in this level of anointing and assignment. And if you can, if your flesh can serve the enemy at level 10, then you can submit yourself to the spirit of God as a starting place, not a finishing place, as a starting place to be level 10 in the kingdom of God. 